You good? You have a good break? Good. I'm a bit nervous. This format kind of pumps you up a bit. But I'm going to talk to you about uh, a project called Sisters Academy. It's a project where we take over the leadership for real of a series of Nordic upper secondary schools, gymnasium level. So close your eyes for one second. And then imagine that your school, this university, was being taken over by a strange twin sister and her enchanting staff. You would no longer be led by the principal of this school. This person would be out of the game completely for two weeks and he would allow this sister and her staff to govern the school, to set up a completely new set of values from which the school would now be governed. You can open your eyes. So, oh, this is not working. Anyway, so the school that we are setting up is the school in what we call a sensuous society. A sensuous society is a society that's dominated and governed by the aesthetic dimension. Now, what do I mean by that? So, the American uh, mythologist and researcher Joseph Campbell points towards the city. Like, if you look in a city, you can always look at the tallest building and then you can see what system has governed and dominated society as a at a certain time. If we narrow it down to the Western world, since the antique up until the Middle Ages, the churches are the tallest building. And it is like that. Try to study it in your city. Uh, so the churches are the tallest building. Uh, the, the, the dominating, validating principle is the religious dimension. So everything, our family life, Life, our educational institutions are led by the principle of the religious dimension. So if you were lucky enough to get an education, you were taught by Jesuits. And we don't think about that very often, the historical conditions of our society. But I'm very optimistic when I think about it, because it means it's changeable. Society changes over time. Then came the civil wars in Europe, and then the town halls, the municipalities, slightly taller than the churches. We are now governed by a new principle, the political dimension. And we all know the values and premises of that, uh, liberty, equality, fraternity. But that only lasts for a few hundred years, because then we have the Industrial Revolution, the financial centers new tallest buildings. And if we look at a cityscape, I think it's e very evident to everyone that we are still governed by the economic dimension. The world is still competing to build the tallest building. So <coughs> we have these kind of new logics dominating, taking over constantly, which means that society changes and we tend to forget that. When we are born into a culture, we think that's the only thing, like that it's, it's not historically changeable, but it is. So of the four kind of major logics that so, uh, sociology very points at as the constitutional logics of society, the only one that hasn't yet dominated, which is also, by the way, in a counterposition to the economic dimension, is the aesthetic. So in critical theory, the aesthetic dimension is very often pointed at as the answer, in a way, or at least as something that's counter-positioning the economic, rational thinking that is dominating today. The aesthetic dimension, so what do I mean by aesthetic? You know, very often, or today, when we say the term aesthetic, we think of form, the way something looks. That's not what I mean. I mean, form is very much often, it's the output of being an in, in an aesthetic mode of being in the world. And the aesthetic mode of being was, uh, again, in a Western context, defined by Baumgarten in the mid-1700s uh, century as perception through the senses. So when we not only experience the world rationally or logically, but we perceive the world through our senses, that's an aesthetic mode of being in the world. And that's what I mean by the aesthetic dimension. And of course, that's always present. We can't avoid that. Right now, 
you are stimulated by me, <laughs> you're having some, you're repelled or attracted, or you have all sort of reactions. We always do that, and that's a sensuous experience. So, of course, this mode is always activated, but we don't celebrate it, and we don't notice it, and we don't train it. We don't stimulate it in today's society. So, <clears throat> Ken Robinson, who did this famous TED talk on changing educational paradigms, also, how many saw that? Yeah, so it's, I think it's the most seen TED talk ever. And he argues that the educational system today is based on the pillars of respectively the Enlightenment. And the, during the Enlightenment, that's also where Descartes states, I am, I think, therefore I am. So human beings are defined by our ability to rationally put things into systems. And the educational is then also shaped from the premises of the economic dimension during the Industrial Revolution. So we ultimately educate people, all of us, to become people who are productive, efficient, and so forth. So the logics of the economic dimension is efficiency, duty before debt, pleasure. We all know it, especially if we read critical theory. So we have this educational system built on the pillars of the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and we have in society primarily governed by the economic dimension. And then we have this, and previously we've been dominated by the religious dimension, the political dimension, and then we have this aesthetic artistic sphere that also during the Industrial Revolution became autonomous. So art became exclusive, and we created the notion of, of an art genius, artist being someone special with a very transcending intelligence. And I think many artists are quite happy with that. I mean, it's a fantastic place to be in the aesthetic domain. That's where we can experience the world through our senses, uh, where intuition is, a, is an okay argument. Why do you do it? Because I feel like it. That's, an, that's actually a valid argument. Um, but this aesthetic dimension, I mean, what would it do if that was more accessible in our everyday life? If we had access to the sensuous and poetic, a world where we experience through our senses, where we turn on a poetic gaze. So my argument is, is that we would actually navigate more sustainably. Also, Schiller said that a, a reason, reason, Vernuft, reason that's not based in the body or tactile knowledge is actually a perverted reason. It's perverted intelligence. If it's not rooted in a tactile and bodily knowledge and experience of the world. So this course, democratizing the aesthetic and opening up this sphere, the realm of the aesthetic also outside the art system, that's um, that's the course that I fight. And I can now try, try to take you through some of these images. So these would be some of the staff that you would be led by. All your teachers, all the researchers, all the administrative staff would all of a sudden have very strange new colleagues. They would meet in the lunch breaks, in the hallways, discussing what is the sensuous? How can we open it? How will we do it here in our workplace? And this is what we've done. This is not a fiction. This is not just an imaginary realm. We're doing this as a crack, as an intervention into manifested systems that are there already, as an opening, a place to explore U-turn impact, perhaps, or radically different modes of being in the world. And there we have the building, the church, the municipality the financial centers. And then, oh, then we have this, because I've talked you through these different dimensions and we talked about the new tallest building. So you could imagine what would the tallest building of a sensuous society be? And maybe it wouldn't be a new tallest building. Maybe it would be, the competition would be who would create the most organic building, like the Iraqi architect Hadid, who did this, on the, how many knows this? Yeah. So online it's just called the vagina, because that's what it looks like, but it's a football stadium. Or would it be the Dome of Visions, another project that I lead and curate? Uh, 
about new sustainable ways of building. So you can use this, the idea of a sentient society, a radical future scenario to imagine future worlds, to not be locked down by the governing principles of today, and that's how you can use performance art. You can use performance art and different aesthetic tools to reinvent the premises from which we live. And you do that bodily, it's not only a thought scenario. Within these worlds, we embody it, we give it an image, so we really tactilely explore new modes of being and being together in the world. This is from one of the schools where we took over the leadership. So the students, they wear uniforms, why? I mean, isn't that a bit the school of a sentient society? Well, it's a performance experiment. So for two weeks, we all look the same. We go into this as in a, as in a ritual. And on these new premises, we explore together. All the teachers, this is one of the teachers in one of the schools, have to innovate their practice. So the schedule continues. You still have math when you have math, philosophy when you have philosophy. But you're led from new premises. So the math teacher, for example, have to consider how would I teach math in a sentient society? How would I do that? So they completely change the way they educate the students. This is also a student in one of the tableaus. We move in there, the new performance staff. We move in there, and we set up these spaces. We transform the school physically completely. So we use what's called immersive performance strategies. Immersion is being compared to being dropped into water. If you were pushed into water, you wouldn't think, um, wait a minute, I can't walk here, then you would drown. Instinctually, you navigate differently. Instinctually, your body would do something else. And this is what you can do with these immersive performance art strategies. You can create possibilities to instinctually, precognitive, navigate differently in the world. Yeah? So we immerse ourselves in these worlds and then we just uh, learn from completely new premises. So for example, the toilet might be pink and filled with a low sound of humming. There is soundscape everywhere. In toilets, in the yards, in the classrooms, like here, you can turn it up or down if you're a teacher, but not in the toilets. A classroom, another classroom, another classroom, another classroom. So we have one week to transform the school because the school is ongoing. This is not a theme week. This is on the curriculum. The students have to go to exam in whatever they're being taught during these two weeks because that's the point that we can intervene into everyday life and do things completely different. It just doesn't only have to be at the carnival. A whole way. So simple strategies, simple, very simple strategies to transform the school physically. So the teachers work on three levels. So one level would be to choose a theme that corresponds with the overall exploration of uh, what sensuous learning would be. And here the math teachers, they collaborated, three math teachers, that's a thing that's happening, that because this is so special, they reach out to their colleagues to reinvent their practice because they can't come up with their answers themselves. So that's like a byproduct of the whole experiment. They chose to work with growth. So what they did was that they collaborated with the gardener who is also a real-life gardener. They planted grass in the gardener's tableau to measure how fast this grass growth grew compared to financial curves and the speed of light, for example. Different examples on how uh, the, the, the educational method development took place. Uh, but again, we don't put up a pamphlet. I don't tell people to do their, conduct their teaching or their practice in a special way. We just uh, put up this radical framework where they innovate their own practice. And this is Peter. And this is the third level that, um, that the teachers work on. It's with their own teacher's role, what we call the poetic self. So the teachers also get the chance to reinvent their role, the way they are in the world. And here maybe we can really begin to talk about you turning impact. Because for example, this is Peter Eriksson. He chose to be the blackbird. And he still is the blackbird. And this is a year and a half ago. One day he came to me in my office 
at the school and asked, if you feel sorrow in the teaching situation, what would you do? Sorrow. And this is a school, it's just regular, a, a regular school, regular schedule going on. And this teacher comes to me and talk about sorrow. Um, and then, yeah, what we talked about was that performatively, this is not psychology. So I could not answer that question psychologically, but performatively, what you can do is that you can give your inner life an image. So what does your sorrow look like? And the next day he came to school completely uh, dressed in black and he was wearing this band of sorrow and he asked to do the morning gathering. We do these morning gatherings where um, everyone can use it as a sort of open lab to express what they're working on. And then he went into the middle of the circle and I had no idea what he was going to do. But then he just, there was silence and it was awkward, very awkward actually. And he was there, all alone, 200 students, 20 teachers around him, all the performers. And then he just began to sing, you know, this um, Beatles song, Blackbird singing in the dead of night. And then it was silence, nothing. And then one student responds in a strong voice, Blackbird singing in the dead of night. This is not planned, it just happens. And then he sings the next line, take these broken wings and learn to fly. And everyone replies, all the students, 200 students, take these broken wings and learn to fly. All my life, I've been waiting for this moment to arrive. And that was it. No more. And that's aesthetic processes. You don't have to articulate it, you don't have to explain it, but all of a sudden you're present, you're together in the room in another way. So what can we draw from this? What conclusions can we draw from this? How does it work into an educational context? Um, so this is also a research project. We collect a lot of data and do a research on transformative impact based on performance universes. And some of the things the data shows, um, which we haven't looked at it that much yet, but un until now what it shows is two major points that might seem quite banal. One of them is, now I can go to school with my entire being. And the other one is, it evokes my desire to learn. If we listen to that, what does it mean? It means I want to learn. So sadly, now, uh, we, do, we have all this focus on competence development and how to stimulate and refine these abilities. But if you don't want to learn, if you have no desire to learn, shouldn't we be focusing on that first? How do we evoke the desire to learn anything at all? The other thing, now I can go to school with my entire being. So one girl, she had this, um, it's a bit of a, again, I don't know, it, it might not be the best example when we talk about human beings, but she sensed herself as a piece of bread. And if you cut a piece of bread into slices, she felt like I'm going to school, I'm navigating in my life as one slice of bread. Uh, but now I feel like I can go to school as the, as the big old bread that I am. Bad picture. Like who wants to be a piece of bread? But this thing of slicing yourself up into pieces of bread to survive the day when school is something that should be vitalizing us. It should be something that puts us to life. And that's the aesthetic also. Sentient society a conceptualization of a future world, a potential future scenario where the aesthetic dimension is governing. And this project, Sisters Academy, as one laboratory to explore what the world would be if we built it on radically different premises. Not as an answer, not as a utopia, as an opening, as a possibility to say it could be completely different. And if it was governed by the aesthetic, then what would it be? So just to wrap up, if you close your eyes and imagine that you could take over the leadership of a school or an institution, any institution, what would you do? What premises would you put at the center? What you would you govern it by? Because systems are changeable. So this is my invitation to you to realize that and to maybe also realize that not only cognitively, but realize it sensually. Thank you so much. <laughs>